Hello. In this video, I am going to talk about the Parliament Acts 1911 and 1949, and about a case called the Crown on behalf of Jackson and Attorney General, in which the validity of the Parliament Act 1949 was challenged. That last statement might sound strange to you, because in Dicey's conception of the sovereignty of Parliament, which you may recall from my video on the legislative supremacy of Parliament, no person or body is recognised by the law of England as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. In Jackson, not only was a challenge to the Parliament Act 1949 brought before the court, but what is more, the challenge was one which, as one of the judges in the case, Lord Nichols put it, was properly cognisable by a court of law. In other words, the challenge did not in fact succeed, but the arguments raised about the validity of the Parliament Act 1949 were ones which the parties were properly entitled to put before the court. We'll get to that, but first it is necessary to go into the background of the Parliament Acts. The first of the Parliament Acts, the Parliament Act 1911, was passed as a resolution to a constitutional crisis that occurred between 1909 and 1911. The House of Commons at the time had a Liberal Party majority led by the Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. The Chancellor of the Exchequer was David Lloyd George. By contrast, the House of Lords, which at the time was composed apart from the 20 odd senior bishops of the Church of England, exclusively of hereditary peers, that is, of men who had inherited their titles and their membership of the House of Lords from their fathers. And the House of Lords, perhaps not surprisingly given its composition, had an impregnable Conservative majority. The result was that Asquith's government succeeded in getting its legislation through the House of Commons, only to have it rejected by the Conservative-dominated House of Lords. It is important to remember that this was a Liberal government on a mission to reform the Constitution. On its agenda was Home Rule for Ireland, then in its entirety still part of the United Kingdom, as well as the disestablishment of the Anglican Church in Wales. This was also a government committed to a number of costly initiatives. It was under the Liberal government that the first publicly funded health services and unemployment benefits were established, and the government was also committed to increased military and naval expenditure as part of the arms build-up that culminated a few years later in the First World War. And to meet these expenditure commitments, the government proposes to raise taxes on the rich. And it was these taxation and expenditure proposals, rather than its constitutional reform programme, that were the immediate cause of the constitutional crisis. It was at the time constitutional convention that the Lords would not oppose a money bill, but the Lords did so nonetheless. Asquith called for an election in an attempt to demonstrate popular backing for his proposals. The election was inconclusive, although the Liberals remained in government with the support of the Irish National Party and the recently established Labour Party, and Lloyd George's budget eventually passed in 1910. But this did not end the standoff between the Commons and the Lords. The Liberal government were determined to cut the Lords down to size. And to cut a long story short, the Liberals were, after a further election which also resulted in a hung parliament, eventually able to do just that. In 1911, Parliament passed the Parliament Act 1911. The legislation passed with the assent of the Lords after Lord Rosebery secured from the new King, George V, a promise to enlarge the House of Lords by creating new Liberal peers if the Parliament Act did not pass. So what did the Parliament Act 1911 do exactly? Well, in short, it curtails the legal powers of the House of Lords. Remember that Parliament, as a legislative body, consists of the House of Commons, the House of Lords and the Monarch, and the assent of each of these three bodies must be secured before legislation can pass. Well, the Parliament Act 1911 provides as a matter of law that in certain situations legislation can pass without the support of the House of Lords. 
Section 1, for example, provides that any money bill, as defined in subsection 2 of section 1, can be sent for royal assent without first obtaining the approval of the House of Lords, provided that certain procedural requirements are met. The power of the Lords is limited to the power to delay for one month. Now let us turn our attention in more detail to section 2 of the Parliament Act 1911. This deals with bills other than money bills. A bill, incidentally, is legislation which has not been passed by Parliament. When it passes all its stages and receives royal assent, that's when we call it an act. Anyway, Section 2, in its original form, says that if a bill is passed by the House of Commons in three successive parliamentary sessions and is rejected by the House of Lords in each of those sessions, then, after it is rejected for the third time, it can be sent for royal assent, notwithstanding that the House of Lords have not assented to it. What this means is that the power that the House of Lords once enjoyed to veto legislation, to refuse it outright, had become a power to delay legislation for two years, or a little longer depending on the parliamentary calendar. Now, that is not an inconsiderable power. A week, as they say, is a long time in politics, and anything could have happened in those three parliamentary sessions. A general election could take place and a new government could be returned, or other political changes could intervene, and, and the government may, at the end of that time, have different political priorities. But what it means that, is that, in the face of a determined House of Commons, the House of Lords must eventually give way. There is one exception to this power under the Parliament Acts to send legislation for royal assent without the approval of the House of Lords, and that is contained in the parentheses of Section 2. It is that legislation could not be passed using the Parliament Act that extend the life of Parliament beyond five years. A question that I will just throw out here for you is, what would happen if the House of Commons did pass such legislation and it was sent for royal assent and Her Majesty approved the legislation? Would that mean the courts could invalidate the legislation? And what does that tell us about the cherished sovereignty of Parliament? Leaving that aside for now, let's turn to the case of the Crown on behalf of Jackson and Attorney General. Jackson concerned a challenge to a piece of legislation passed by the Blair government. The legislation was the Hunting Act 2004, and it banned the hunting of wild animals with dogs. The act was aimed at fox hunting, the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible, as Oscar Wilde had called it, but the legislation was drawn more widely than just fox hunting. The Labour government at that time clearly sympathised with Oscar Wilde, but the House of Lords clearly didn't, and it was refused on successive occasions by the House of Lords. Now, it wasn't just that the Hunting Act was passed under the 1911 Act. How could it ever be that simple? In fact, there was another Parliament Act, the Parliament Act 1949. What the Parliament Act 1949 did was to amend the earlier 1911 Act, to reduce the length of time that the Lords could delay legislation other than a money bill to one year. But here's the thing that really set the cat among the pigeons. The 1949 Act had not received the approval of the House of Lords. Why not? Because it had been rejected by the House of Lords three times and was sent to His Majesty the King George VI for royal assent. This was described at the time by the Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee as a wise precautionary measure and by Winston Churchill as a deliberate act of socialist aggression. In other words, the Parliament Act 1949 passed under the procedure established by the Parliament Act 1911 without the approval of the House of Lords. And the Hunting Act passed not under the Parliament Act 1911 itself, as originally enacted, but after a delay of one year under the Act as amended by the 1949 Act. So to summarise, with the aid of a diagram, Parliament consisting of the Commons, Lords and Sovereign passes the Parliament Act 1911. Now, using the power of the 1911 Act ostensibly to sidestep the Lords, the Commons approves and royal assent is given for the Parliament Act 1949. 
And under the Parliament Act procedure as modified by the 1949 Act, the Commons approved the Hunting Act 2004, which was in turn sent for and received royal assent. And Jackson and the Countryside Alliance had a really ingenious argument. They argued that the Parliament Act couldn't be used to modify itself, and that in sending the 1949 Act for royal assent, the Commons had sought to do exactly that. And if the Parliament Act was not properly passed, then neither was the Hunting Act 2004. Tally ho! <laughs> not as easy as you might think, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it is a fundamental principle that when Parliament delegates the power to legislate, that power must be strictly exercised within the limits laid down by Parliament. So it would go against the principle if in the exercise of delegated powers, the body to whom powers were, were delegated could legislate to extend their powers. But was the power established by the Parliament Act a delegated power? This is something over which the giants of the field of constitutional law had disagreed. S. A. De Smith had argued in his textbook on constitutional and administrative law that the Parliament Act should not be understood as delegating power from Parliament in its full sense of commons, lords and monarch to, if you like, a subcommittee consisting only of commons and monarch. Rather, in De Smith's view, Parliament had, by passing the 1911 Act, redefined itself for particular purposes. Parliament, in other words, was still Parliament, even when legislating using the Parliament Act procedure. It was not acting under delegated authority, but was the full authority of a sovereign Parliament. An equally weighty authority, Sir William Wade disagreed. In his Hamlin Lectures, Constitutional Fundamentals, published in 1980, Wade argued that legislation passed under the Parliament Act bore the mark of delegated legislation. The acid test of primary legislation, he wrote, is that it is accepted by the courts at its own face value, without needing support from any superior authority. But an act passed by Queen and Commons only has no face value of its own. In other words, legislation passed under the Parliament Act 1911 had validity only as a result of the 1911 Act, and as such it was limited to the terms on which that power was granted. So who was right, De Smith or Wade? The judgment is quite complex because although the decision was unanimous, there are seven concurring opinions in addition to the lead opinion of Lord Bingham, and they all say slightly different things. But what can we say? First, the House of Lords held that legislation passed under the Parliament Act 1911, like the 1949 Act and the Hunting Act 2004, were primary legislation. They were Acts of Parliament with full legal effect, to use Lord Bingham's expression. In other words, De Smith was correct. The 1911 Act, Lord Bingham acknowledged, did of course affect an important constitutional change, but the change lay not in authorising a new form of sub-primary parliamentary legislation, but in creating a new way of enacting primary legislation. And because the 1949 Act was of full effect, so therefore was the Hunting Act 2004. Tally no, Jackson. But we can ask some more searching questions about the limitations on the powers of Parliament using the Parliament Act procedure. Like, were there any legally enforceable limits on what legislation could pass under the Parliament Act procedure? What about legislation extending the life of Parliament? Could a court rule such an exercise of the Parliament Act procedure invalid? Since this was an explicit restriction contemplated by the Act, it would appear so. But what if Parliament were to try to evade the restrictions on Section 2, Subsection 1 by passing two bills, the first to remove the restriction contained in Section 2, Subsection 1, and the second to extend the life of Parliament? Their lordships were divided on this question. Lord Bingham thought that such a two-step approach would be permissible. Lord Nichols and Lady Hale thought that it wouldn't. <laughs> 
Others were prepared to go further and to contemplate the possibility of other implicit restrictions. Could the 1949 Act be used to abolish the House of Lords, asked Lord Steyne. Strict legalism, he said, would suggest that it could. But then he added, but I am deeply troubled about assenting to the validity of such an exorbitant assertion of government power in our bicameral system. It may be that such an issue would test the relative merits of strict legalism and constitutional legal principles in the courts at the most fundamental level. He went on, the supremacy of Parliament is still the general principle of our Constitution. It is a construct of the common law. The judges created this principle. If that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise where the courts may have to qualify a principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. Lord Hope continued where Lord Steyne left off. The rule of law enforced by the courts, he said, is the ultimate controlling factor on which our constitution is based. And he added, the fact that your lordships have been willing to hear this appeal and give judgment upon it is another indication that the courts have a part to play in defining the limits of Parliament's legislative sovereignty. All of this is, of course, obiter. In other words, it is not part of what was decided in the case of Jackson. But over obiter cases can be important because they lay down the markers for the future. It may be that this statement could come to be relied upon in some future ruling, as might Lord Bingham's more restrictive approach, of course. But to get back to the Parliament Act, what these acts signify is a permanent diminution of the power of the House of Lords. And with this diminution has come a change of role. The House of Lords no longer stands as a powerful arbiter of whether legislation that seeks to effect substantial social change has sufficient popular backing, but it has in the years since 1911 established its role in revising and improving legislation and as a constitutional watchdog. Reforming of the powers of the House of Lords led to a reimagining of its role, a beneficial one you might argue in this case. But we should always be aware of the possibility of unintended consequences of reforming our constitutional institutions. I'll see you in the next video.